do not know who Matt Alonzo is, just stand up and get out of here. Because <laughs> Matt Alonzo is incredible. He's done Justin Bieber music videos, Snoop Dogg. He's shot for some of the biggest artists out there. I love Matt in particular because Matt is the perfect example of the indie hustle. He's the perfect example of someone that starts small and gets big over time just by putting in hard work, not being limited by the tools that you're working with. And year by year, he gets better and better. I know that I am really excited to see what kind of content Matt's working on next. He's going to be working on, he's doing feature films now. He's getting bigger and bigger every year. You see those DPs that are right there on the bubble of blowing up and being enormous. Matt's already there, but I think he's going to break into the stratosphere next year. So without much further ado, we're going to play some content. Some of the artists that Matt Alonzo has worked with on these screens. But let's give one more round of applause for Matt Alonzo. <laughs> we're going to play a commercial. Thank you. Great team. Great team, Matt. Really appreciate uh, appreciate them for reaching out to me. I'm excited to give back to you guys. So kind of what I did when they contacted me is I went through you know, a lot of my emails, my DMs, and really kind of figured out what you guys were really asking, what, what the bulk of, of the questions were coming in, and, and, and that demographic, and kind of shaped a class that would fit those, you know, answer those type of questions in, in that demographic. And you know, I was getting a lot of filmmakers who were you know, shooting stuff for under 20000 and maybe didn't have the tools that they thought they needed to successfully take the next step. And I kind of crafted this class to let you guys know that the tools are already within you, and you guys have them. And, um, and that's kind of what this class is about. Um, and and how, to do it, you guys, how to do it yourself. I mean, I've been in hotel rooms, and I've used shirts and sheets as bounce boards, and, and there's a fusion. You know, and, and I feel like um, a little bit of that gap is missing from, from the mind. You know, film school is not really so much of an option anymore. I did go to film school. Um, and, and those are some of the things that we were able to work out without clients on our backs. So we were able to kind of get through some of those, those hard times with, you know, grades as being your, you know, the, the thing that was uh, determining, you know, how good your film was, not necessarily paying your rent and if you were going to make it in the film industry or not. So I want to be able to give back some of, the, some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. And really the goal is so that when you guys leave this class, understand that you guys can do whatever it is that you want, no matter the situation. Um, I have a lot of emails of like, well, you know, I turned this job down because I didn't have such and such or this or this. And you guys, as you guys will see, you know, I didn't have much either. So and we made the best out of what we had. And, and that's kind of what I want to, want, to, want to give back and teach to you guys as, as well. So, um, so yeah. A little bit about me, um, I started early on. My dad uh, bought a video camera when we were really young, VHS, and you know, always had it in my face. Uh, I didn't, wasn't a huge fan of it at first, apparently, but then I, he plugged it into the TV, and I thought I was on TV. I thought I was really on TV. So I really just became, it became no different than a family member, you know, the, the BHS camera and just always having it. So eventually I took it and started finding ways to, to incorporate it myself. Um, and, you know, for my dad, you know, we didn't have much. We kind of came and, yeah, oh, man, yeah, it's good stuff right there. You know, and, and the reason I show this stuff for you guys is, is, is so that you guys understand that, like, your first projects don't need to be whatever it is that you guys are seeing on TV. I mean, this is years and years and years and years of, just shooting and shooting and shooting to get to a certain level. And, and, and that's kind of the message I want to instill in you guys is just shoot. You know what I mean? Like, the, I mean, you know, this, is, this was the best at the time. So, you know, <laughs> you know, so, you know, we were, you know, making short films. And, and this is, you know, this is middle school. And this is kind of, you know, this, is, this has been in me since I was a kid. I didn't know any other way. And, um, but like I said, the camera was constantly in my hand. Or I was constantly editing. I learned how to plug in two VCRs. I literally filmed anything I possibly could, whether it was my friends playing football. I, mean, I played sports my whole life as well. And in and, and, and that sense of camaraderie, uh, there's my dad. He's here. So shout out to my dad because... Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, my dad's the one who put the camera in my face, and he, and he really made it possible. I got to make sure his cameos are on here. He hated it. He hated it when I filmed them. So I, I, love, I love showing that. Um, but, but really, I mean... Go out and shoot and shoot and just do not put down your camera. I didn't know anything about 
any, any sort of composition. I didn't know anything about film. I was 12 years old, you know. But having that camera in my hand naturally teaches you these certain skills. And, and obviously, you grow your, your style, you know. And um, you don't need to have a budget. You don't need to have a specific project. Sometimes you just got to go out and shoot. And, um, and I see a lot of you guys with your cameras out here today, so that's, that's, that's a plus. Look at that. that that's, that's in junior high. That's me on the screen and me interviewing myself. <laughs> And that was, for, that was for a book report. So, you know, I, I learned how to get creative, though, at a very young age with what I had. These are, this is VHS, you know. So as you learn your tool, as your tool, you know, continues to stay in your hand, you will, you will grow, you know, and, and you will naturally grow. You don't have to necessarily watch so much or wait for the perfect project to come across your, your desk, you know. If, if you're out there constantly shooting and, and, you know, growing, when that project does come across your desk, you don't have to scramble to find the tools to do it, you know what I mean? You already have them instilled and you have the confidence within yourself because you're so used to being with the camera. See, as I got older, I started replicating a lot of things I was seeing, title sequences. I had no, there was no training whatsoever. I mean, obviously, you know, it's iMovie, so, you know, it's a little bad, but, but, but for the time, just kind of constantly the evolution of having that camera in my hand and, and, and what it did for my craft, you know, yeah, 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 no, 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 you know. <laughs> But hey, I mean, look at this reverse right here, like, ooh, you know, so at the time, you know, but, but and it's crazy because a lot of these skills, I actually, you know, used a couple of these actual uh, ideas in music videos, you know, whether it was, you know, putting the camera on, you know, static and, and having multiple, um, multiple shots of the artist all in one shot. I learned that when I was 12 years old, 13 years old, you know, so, um, you know, my advice to you guys is, like I said, just constantly have a camera in your hand if, if, that's, your, if that's your tool, if it's a computer, whatever it is. I mean, I, I edit, I direct, and I stayed on the computer constantly, or, you know, back then it was two VCRs, but, and even now, I, I spend 14 hours a day either on a camera or on a computer just because I don't know any other way. So, um, yeah. So then I did go to film school, and my advice really is, yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, for, for me, film school, I don't think it's so much a, a, a need anymore, but I feel like what's missing is the psychology of film, and that's kind of what's getting skipped over. And as well, like I said, being able to practice and learn your craft without having the pressure of paying bills and, and uh, pretty much making or breaking it. I mean, I feel like a lot of people put a pressure on themselves to, you know, this next project has to make me or break me, and I understand that because I have the same sort of pressure, but, you know, if... Uh, if film school is even an idea in your mind, I would, you know, whether it's a city college or whatever, I would, uh, I would highly suggest to look into it a little bit more and just kind of see if that's an option for you. Um, and like I said, a lot of people right now are about 8K and 12K and this sensor and this sensor, but yet you don't even know when to cut into a close-up and why to cut into a close-up and what that conveys to your audience. And for me, filmmaking, even at a young age, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was replicating what I was seeing and I was replicating the emotions that were being created in the movies that I liked. And that, I feel like, is completely just gone because everybody's so caught up in the new lenses and the new this and the new that. And I, I get it. Technology is just taking over. But if you don't know your craft, you are just filming a higher quality piece of nothing. So, you know, you know my big thing, I don't know if you know, some of you guys follow me. Uh, just pause it there. Uh, some, you know, my big thing is not so much about cameras. Um, it's really about knowing your craft. And... If you look at my Instagram, there's videos I shot on my iPhone, and there's videos I've shot, you know, $250,000 budget. So, you know, uh, I, I, it's just about knowing your craft. And, and like I said, just practicing it and, and making it a priority, you know what I mean? Like, I understand we all want this one project or that project, but it takes a lot of little projects like this to get to that project. And just having them under your belt is going to, you know, have your mindset and, and, and your confidence in a, different, in a different position than it is right now. So uh, I went to film school. I was working... Um, at a record label. Uh, when I graduated, I was interning for them, and I actually um, started directing and editing for them. Go ahead, Nerds, play this one. So yeah, so then I got into Final Cut. I was doing split screen, stuff like this. I mean, this was uh, like 13 years ago. So, you know, now it's like, oh, everybody does that. But back then, no one was doing it. This was, it was, you know, different. But so I was working for this record label, and his other, his other um, business was a uh, infomercial company. He had a colon cleanse. So I was doing half, half my day was doing this and half my day was doing his colon cleanse infomercials. Um, eventually, it was, like I said, this was 13, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Um, and some of this stuff, I mean, it still could play. But um, as I was doing that, eventually the record label folded. He spent too much money on it. So 
uh, I started working consistently on colon cleanse infomercials. Um, I was making a, a great salary. You know, I had um, like, you know, laundry paid for every Friday and, you know, whatever, whatever the, the perks were. Um, but I called my dad one day, and I remember just sitting in there, because the guy would sit next to me right here and just be like, hey, oh, you know, color correct my, my neck or, you know, just, just stuff. He did, I, wasn't, I wasn't growing as an artist. You know, the money was great, but I wasn't really growing as an artist. I was kind of the top guy there, and it wasn't really much for me to go, you know, much, much more for me to grow or, or learn. So I quit. Like, my dad, I might call my dad, and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I remember crying. I called my dad crying. I was 21, 22. I don't know what to do. Like, I'm not growing. So I quit. I just quit straight up. I had, I had no savings. Like, I wasn't planned. I just literally walked out one day. Um, and with that, you know, comes all that comes with walking out of a job. You know, I lost my car. I lost my, you know, apartment. I lost the, a lot of perks and, and things I had. So it was a little rough. You know, Top Ramen and, uh, and, and all those type of things were, you know, that was gourmet. That was like, you know, peanut butter and jelly was, was daily, you know. Um, but then I went back to the grind, and my mentality was like, I'm going to make it, and I don't really, this doesn't, it wasn't even a, a fall for me. I didn't, I didn't feel it at all, and now I just felt more free to kind of do what I wanted to do. Not saying, I'm not advising any of you guys to go quit a job, so please, <laughs> do, do not take that as a message. So what I started doing was Craigslisting. Craigslist was really big back then. So what I did was, I mean, I would do anything. I would import, I remember importing 200 tapes for $200, logging, capturing, uh, anything that I could possibly do. Some stuff was for free. I mean, I just did whatever I possibly could to find an avenue. I just felt like something was going to break, and, and, and I, I took every advantage. I took every job as, as finding the advantage in it, whether it was networking or just maybe it would be my big break. I didn't know what I didn't. You just don't know where it's going to come. You know, that one job you say no to might have been your big break. It just might have been, you know, you might have met somebody on set that propelled you into your next job. You just never know. Um, and um, so, yeah, this is, uh, this is HBX, you know, this is uh, DVX, sorry, mini DV tapes. And, uh, yeah, so and I just literally went back to the grind. I think I got paid $100 for this music video. So I, I really, um, I just made an effort to shoot everything I possibly could. Um, and I got a call for, um, uh, to come and cover a concert. And I said, okay, the, 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 the artist was horrible. I mean, I might mean horrible. <laughs> Horrible. It wasn't that. It wasn't that bad, but it was pretty bad. So, uh, but I showed up to the concert. They gave me two hundred bucks. Little Wayne happened to be the headline. I didn't know until I showed up, and Little Wayne's name was on the on the billboard in San Diego. So, uh, I, at the time, I was a huge Wayne fan. The Carter had just came out, and uh, I asked them, "Please let me shoot your the show." And they said, "No, you cannot. Like, there's no shooting whatsoever." The guy I was with, and we kind of just rubbed some elbows. I told them I would edit whatever they, they wanted me to do. They could have the content, like whatever they wanted me to do, just let me shoot it. Because in my mind, I was like, this is my break. Like, I, you know, it's Wayne. I, I, you know, I can, I, can make a, I can make something out of it. So um, long story short, they let me shoot. Uh, I edited a bunch of stuff for them. But I took this home that night, drove back to L.A. I cut this up, and I had it up uh, on YouTube the next morning. Um, you don't have to play the audio. You can just... Yeah, no one, no one needs to hear that. That's when Wayne was, <laughs> although that's when Wayne was hot, though. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I shot this, and, um, you know, I had two cameras, uh, me and another guy, uh, H, two, two, no, HBX and a one-chip camera, you know. And uh, back then, people still had better equipment than us. I mean, people were shooting this concert with whatever it was top-of-the-line cameras were at the time, but that didn't phase us. We weren't discouraged. We didn't you know, feel any type of way, like, oh, well, I wish I had that camera, only if, or, or what, you know, things like that. No, it, for me, it was like, I don't really care what you, you have. I'm going to go home and destroy you. Like, it's just the way I felt inside. No, really, it's just the way I felt inside, you know, and it wasn't like a cocky thing or anything. I just, I, you, you have to have that sort of tenacity, you know, in this industry and just believe in yourself. The split screens nowadays is, is, you know, it's overdone, but this was, you know, like I said, 11 years ago. So this really, like, put me on the map. Uh, it was all over the blogs, and, and back then I, I labeled it as official music video. So it was like Lil Wayne's official music video. <laughs> yeah, I know. Nowadays it's funny because everybody, you know, but back then it just wasn't what it what it is now. YouTube was not very popping. You know what I mean? So um, I met uh, DJ Ski, having uh, Ski TV, uh, which was one of the first YouTube channels. Um, he reached out to me, and this is the stuff I was doing as as this was going on. This is all Final Cut. I've known Kendrick and Tyga and all these guys since then, and uh, we were the little guys, so we kind of just hung out together and, and, and shot. But when I'm, you know, you, you don't know who the connections you're making. You don't know who that artist is. You don't really, I mean, because he was, he was still K Dot at the time. 
we would put hours and hours and hours into this stuff, you know what I mean? And, and you know, back then, it would maybe get 200 views. So it, it's not like it, it paid off right away, but, you know, we definitely had the work ethic. Um, and so, yeah, so DJ Ski reached out to me, and he was starting Ski TV. Um, they didn't have much there as a company at the time, so we kind of partnered up and said, okay, I'll bring in what I have, and you bring in what you have, and let's, let's, let's hit the go button on this thing. And, um, and so we did, and that's kind of, you go to the next one? Yeah, so then this was kind of my first music video. Ski was kind of involved, but we were still like talking, negotiating. But the evolution is really kind of what, what I'm showing here. And um, this was a JVC or some, some sort of, I don't even know what camera it was. Stock lenses, you know, three lights. The budget was like $3,000, you know. And, and we kind of just, it, we shot for, I don't know, six hours maybe, you know. And I had it, you know, cut up in a, in a day or two. Um, but we really went above and beyond, you know. We didn't have a big crew. We probably had, you know, six or seven guys that, that had been loyal with me, um, but we just constantly shot. So you go to the next one. When I, met, when I met with Ski, Ski called me. He says, hey, you want to shoot a music video with Snoop Dogg? I said, okay, yeah, sure, that's Ski. And uh, so that was my first video with Ski, and uh, it was crazy. We probably had two lights. We had two lights and, uh, like, 100 models. And, <laughs> yeah, ben, that was Ben Baller's first cameo, you know, so it, it, was, it was interesting, you know, it was, it was definitely, definitely uh, growing. Um, and then after that, he, he, was, he had a really good connection with Interscope, so we were able to get this video. This video was, uh, I believe, $10,000, and the marketing agency gave us, the marketing department gave us this video, actually not the actual commissioner, because at that time, videos were still two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, so... For them to think that you could shoot an actual video on ten thousand dollars just wasn't even—it was a joke. They laughed at us and, and they said, "Okay, you think you guys think you can do it? Here's ten thousand. See what you guys can do." So we did this, and that's what kind of began to change the whole thing. And then Dope Boys is really what kind of with Ski is really what uh, kind of changed things. Uh, that was a red one, um, and uh, some Cook lenses. I think the budget there was fifteen thousand. Um, yeah, fifteen thousand. And uh, I mean, we went to work. We had two cameras. You know, it was it was it was a great day. It was it was fun. We put a lot of a lot of work into that. Um, but the opportunity, I mean, we just never put a camera down. This was just back to back to back to back. You know, and the opportunity that I got was for shooting a concert for two hundred dollars for a no name artist who I absolutely hated. You know, at the time. So, not not hated them, but I hated their music. It was just so bad. I was just like, man. But you know, at the same time, you had to pay, take the paycheck and. They, want, they, you know, they talked about shooting other music videos, so in my mind, I'm like, okay, you know, you know you just got to take every avenue possible, at least to keep the lights on. Um, but fortunately for me, this is what it was able to do and able to send me into this company. And then from there, Vivo wasn't out at the time, so what we were able to do was um, basically premiere all the videos on our channel, You're a Jerk, and all this stuff back, back then. And then we were able to go to branding companies and tell them, hey, we have X amount of views on our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll shoot a commercial for you, we'll shoot content for you, and pay us to do it. And we became a marketing agency, and that's where I got a lot of that stuff, um, you know, a lot of experience there. And it was a great opportunity. I mean, it was constant shooting, and the money wasn't, you know, what, what it should be, but uh, it, was an, it was an opportunity to get my name known. And a lot of these videos really helped me, um, you know, get on the map. The uh, Fly Like a G6 video that you saw in there, I'm not sure how many people know that video, but that's actually got... I actually got signed to ICM from that video uh, as a feature film director, which was my fourth video, I believe, with Ski. We shot it on a 5D. Budget was $10,000. I had a crew of maybe seven guys with me. So uh, we used a 5D and a ring light, and that was it. You know? So I don't know if you guys know the Fly Like a G. So fly like a G. That was horrible, but yeah. You guys know, you guys know that song. But, uh, but basically what I'm saying, you know, overall, is what I'm saying is that we didn't have much, and we made the most out of what we had, you know what I mean, and the opportunities that presented themselves to us. And... And that only came from, uh, well, at least for me anyways, you know, having that sort of groundwork early on, um, grabbing the camera and just consistently shooting and, and just feeling confident within myself and whatever tools that were made available to me to make sure that I could make the best, you know, best possible uh, product. Uh, and then from there, you know, I've, I've went on to do all this stuff, cool stuff. And yeah, it's, it's been a great ride. Um, but even these videos, I mean, a lot of these videos, I mean, the budgets weren't, you know, ginormous. And, you know, you kind of have to make the best of what you have. I mean, I think that, you know, Martians vs. Goblins, which is a big video, um, you know, the budget was 20000 I believe. And 
you know, we shot three days. So, I mean, you spread that out. It's not very, the budget's relatively small, you know. And, and the keynote flows that are actually in there, I mean, that's manually lit, you know what I mean? Like, we didn't have all these fancy gadgets and things like that. We just didn't even think about it. We didn't even care. We just had whatever, whatever tools they were going to, you know, give to us and we could fit in our budget. We were good with and We were going to make it work and we were going to, you know, be creative and be, you know, uh, just take it to the next step with whatever we had and push the limits, you know, and that's really what, uh, you know, I want to teach you guys is, is, or just, I mean, you guys already know this stuff and it's just kind of believing within yourself to, to take the next step and, and to really, you know, use whatever tools you do have. And, and I know that a lot of you guys have more tools than I was possessed with at this time. You know, we didn't have these free fly systems and, and, and these amazing quasars and, and these aperture lights. I mean, this wasn't, you know, in our tool chest at the time. And if it was, you know, who knows? The sky was the limit, and the sky, the sky is the limit for you guys, and that's really, you know, what I want to instill for you guys is really just kind of take your craft seriously and just don't put down that camera, don't put down whatever it is that's your tool or, or your instrument. So um, so now we'll get into some of, like, basic lighting. I'm a director overall. I mean, that's really what I do, um, a director, editor. Um, but at the same time, being a director, I've, uh, I've DP'd a lot of projects as well, and I've pissed off a lot of DPs as well. So, you know, I kind of, you know, was able to, to, to learn DP. As a director, you really have to know what you want. You know, everyone's going to look to you, and you have to be decisive, and you have to be firm. And, uh, and I'll let you guys know right now, I mean, nothing on set goes, and I'm sure you guys know, but if, for those who don't, nothing, nothing goes the way that it's planned. I mean, everything is constantly shifting, moving, whether it's a short film, um, commercials, uh, music video, you know, it's, it's, it's always moving. You know, I've had artists show up 12 hours late and then say, hey, I got one take. I want to, I'm, I'm out, I'm out. I'm like, yo, it's your video, man. Like, come on, you know, but you have to be able to, you have to be able to figure out, okay, well then what do I do with the other 12? You know, what am I shooting? What, what can I recreate? And you have to go back to the paper. You have to be able to do it on the fly and, and really kind of use whatever it is that you do have. 